We recently began a new sermon series titled Just Before the Cross. Uh, in this series, we are looking at all that Jesus taught his disciples from John chapter 13 to John chapter 17. These were the last things that Jesus taught his disciples before, just before he was crucified to death and later rose again from the dead. And the passage we are looking at today, this morning, is John chapter 14, verses 1 to 17. I'm going to be reading a portion of this passage. Verse 14 onwards. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I'm going to skip reading a few verses now and move on to verse 15 in the same passage. Verse 15. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or comforter to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is the word of the Lord. If you remember the background and context from the earlier chapter, all this happened on the night that Jesus would be arrested and soon after that crucified the next day. Jesus was having a meal with his disciples and in the middle of the, we of the meal, Jesus rose and washed the feet of his disciples to show them how they are to love one another. But even as he does this, he tells his disciples that, that one of them is going to betray him to death and another is going to deny him. At this juncture, the disciples are perhaps just beginning to comprehend that something is going to happen to Christ, that he is going to be crucified. They're confused, they are afraid, and they are deeply troubled. If you remember, John chapter 13 verse 21 tells us that Jesus himself was very troubled in his heart at his coming crucifixion. But even in his own agony, Jesus loves his disciples to the very end. He comforts them. The passage I read this morning are the words of Christ comforting his disciples. Martin Luther called this passage the best and the most comforting sermon that the Lord Jesus Christ delivered on earth. The best and the most comforting sermon that our Lord Jesus delivered here on earth. So this morning, if you are in need of comfort for your troubles and your anxiety, I pray this word of Christ will bring deep comfort to your troubled hearts. I'd like to draw two things out for us from this passage. The singular nature of our troubles and the twin nature of our comfort. The singular nature of our troubles and the twin nature 
of our comfort. Let's start with the first thing. The singular nature of our troubles. Why does God allow suffering? Why does a good God allow suffering? This has been one of the greatest philosophical questions that has perplexed mankind for hundreds of years. If you are a young believer, if you're young in your faith in Christ, you too are probably wrestling with some variation of this very question. Many, many people, many people have suggested many, many answers to this question. But sadly, the most true and the most obvious answer to this, answer to this question is hardly ever discussed. Why does a good God allow suffering? Do you know what's the most true and the most obvious answer to this question? God allows suffering because we deserve it. There is no working around this truth. The only reason there is suffering in this world is because we messed up with our sin. We messed up the perfect world that God had initially created. You and I and every human being from the time of Adam, our sin, our greed, our selfishness, that is the reason why there is suffering in this world. We mess this world up with our sin. And so we deserve every bit of suffering in this world and more. But thankfully, God did not leave us and this world to suffer for our sins. He sent his sinless son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus became the atoning sacrifice who took on the punishment for all of your sins and mine. What Jesus does for us is, is best understood by seeing the gospel as a five chapter framework, a story of five chapters, creation, fall, redemption, renewal, and new creation. Chapter one is creation. God created all things perfect and beautiful, and there was no suffering in this world. Chapter 2 is the fall. Human beings sinned, we sinned, and we brought suffering upon ourselves and upon this world as the curse for our sins. Chapter 3 is redemption. Jesus came as a man, fully God, fully man, lived a sinless life died and rose again and offered salvation to everyone who would believe in him. He suffered death on the cross, bearing the punishment for our sins. He rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and 40 days after his resurrection, when he ascended into heaven, he promised he will come back again to wipe away every suffering in this world. Chapter 4 is renewable, a chapter we are now living in. Now, as we wait for Jesus to come back, whatever suffering that remains is not punishment. For us, those of us who believe in Jesus, the suffering that remains exists to, to test our faith in Jesus, to refine our faith in Jesus, to prove our faith in Jesus. Chapter 5 is the new creation. Jesus is going to come back again. And he's going to usher in a new heavens and a new earth. And he's going to wipe away every suffering in this world. We will see God face to face and we will live with him forever. If you look at this five chapter gospel framework, suffering exists in three of these five chapters. Suffering is the headline in chapter three redemption. Here Jesus, he suffered death on the cross to earn, to purchase forgiveness for our sins. Suffering also exists in chapter 2 of the gospel story, the fall. Suffering here is punishment. 
Suffering also exists in chapter 4 of the gospel story, renewal. But this suffering in chapter 4 of the gospel story is not punishment, but this is the testing, the refining, and the proving of our faith. In this chapter, chapter 4, of, chapter 4 renewal in the gospel story, suffering is one way in which God sanctifies us, makes us more and more like Jesus. Suffering in chapter 2 of the gospel story is punishment, but suffering in chapter 4 of the gospel story is redemptive. All that said, here is the big point that I want to make about the nature of our suffering. If our faith in Jesus is whole and true, then we will never experience, we will never directly experience the suffering of chapter 2. We will only experience chapter 4 suffering. If our faith in Jesus is true, none of our suffering will ever be punishment from God. All of our suffering has been graciously loved by God to help us become more and more like Christ. That's the nature of our suffering. Never chapter 2 suffering, only chapter 4 suffering. And this has great application for us in our lives. All of us we are haunted by some fear or the other. What if I get laid off? And what if I end up with no money at all? What if I'm diagnosed with a critical illness? What if my spouse dies? What if I stay single and lonely all my life? What if my children drift away from God? What if our marriage falls apart? We all have many such fears. I pray that none of this ever happens to anyone here. But if any of this does happen to anyone, we can draw great comfort in the truth that this is not chapter 2 suffering. This is not God's punishment. This can only be chapter 4 suffering or suffering that God has graciously allowed to make us more and more like Christ. God is not against us. God has not abandoned us. God is with us and he will turn every suffering for our good. And when Christ comes again, all suffering will be gone. It will be like a bad dream that we can barely even remember. And this is the singular nature of our suffering. We will only experience chapter 4 suffering, which is redemptive. We will never experience chapter 2 suffering, which is punishment. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So that's the first thing I wanted to draw out for us from this passage. The singular nature of our suffering. The second thing that I'd like to draw out for us from this passage is the twin nature of the comfort that Christ offers us. The twin nature of our comfort. In this passage, Jesus offers his disciples two great assurances of comfort. The first assurance of comfort is found at the very beginning of this chapter. Chapter 14, verse 1 onwards. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And Jesus goes on to say, In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, we, and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. 
Okay, let's be very honest here. Imagine you're having a, going through a major crisis at work. And imagine this crisis is really consuming you. And in the middle of this crisis, you read this verse where Jesus says, He's preparing a place for you in heaven. He's preparing a home for you in heaven. Are you going to find great comfort in this? That he's building a home for us? I think not. Surely, Christ is not a, a real estate developer. Uh, I know homes in Mumbai are a challenge. Even then, what comfort can a home in heaven give us here and now in our trouble? You know, this verse is one of the greatest promises of intimacy with Christ that is found in the entire Bible. There is so much more than real estate development that is happening here. In the Jewish culture in Jesus' time, when a man was ready to get married, he would go, he would leave his father's house, he will go to find a bride. And when he finds a bride, he would come back to his father's house and he would build another wing in his father's house for him and his bride to live in. And once the new wing in his father's house is built, he would go get married and bring his bride and live with his bride in the new wing in his father's house. This is what is happening in this verse. Jesus came to earth to find his bride, us, the church. We were ugly, we were sinful, but Christ made us beautiful. He made us radiant without blemish by his death and his resurrection from the dead. And having come to earth and, and found his bride, he has gone back to his father's house to build a new wing in his father's house for us. He will come back to unite with us in the wedding of the Lamb. And he will take us to be with him as his bride forever and ever. This verse is not about real estate development. This verse is one of the greatest assurances of deep and beautiful intimacy we will enjoy with Christ as his eternal bride. Our greatest comfort in present suffering is the future hope of our wedding with Christ, our bridegroom. One day, when Christ comes again, we will become his bride. And all pain and all suffering will be gone. We will be in his arms forever. That is the first of the twin assurances that Christ offers us in this passage. But this assurance is only an assurance of the future. And none of us know when Christ is going to come back again and make us his bride. So what about here and now? And that's the second of the two assurances of comfort that Christ gives us in this passage. Christ not only offers us future comfort, he also offers us present comfort. And this second assurance of comfort in our suffering is found in the same chapter in verses 15 to 17, the portion that we read. Let me read this again. Verse 15. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, a comforter, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The ESV version of the Bible uses the word helper to describe the Holy Spirit. 
the KJV version and many other versions uses the word comforter. The word actually has both meanings. It means both things. The Greek word describing the Holy Spirit in the original text is the word parakletos. Parakletos. It means comforter, helper, and advocate. The Holy Spirit, the parakletos, he is the one who comforts us and helps us as we walk through every chapter four suffering in our life. There is something extraordinarily beautiful in the way Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, in the way Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit for the very first time, parakalitos. I don't know if Jesus coined this word parakletos or comforter, but I do know that it was Jesus who used this word for the very first time in the Bible. The first time this word is found in the Bible is the first time Jesus used this word to introduce the comforter or a helper, the Holy Spirit to his disciples in John chapter 14, 16. This word for comforter, parakletos, used to, is used only five times in the New Testament and never in the Old Testament. It is used four times by Jesus in this farewell discourse between John chapter 13 and John chapter 17. And once it is used in the book of 1 John, and in the four times that it is, it is used in this portion, it refers to the Holy Spirit. And once when it, it is used in 1 John, it refers to Christ himself. Here's the point. This is not just a new word that Jesus is introducing. Jesus is introducing to his disciples a new experience of himself that only the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the parakletos can bring. Jesus is inviting his disciples to a new experience of himself that only the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, our comforter, can bring. The word helper has been used in the Bible before. Eve is described as a suitable helper. The word for this, this word helper in the original language is the word Ezer. Ezer and Parakletos are very, very different. Ezer is an earthly helper. Parakletos, our comforter, is a heavenly helper. Ezer, the earthly helper, is finite, limited, and created. Parakletos, the Holy Spirit, is infinite, unlimited, eternal, not created. Ezer fell. Parakletos is holy, infallible. In the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, our comforter, Jesus is inviting his disciples and us to an experience of heavenly comfort that only this Parakletos, our comforter, the Holy Spirit, can bring. Only he can provide us this heavenly comfort in our times of chapter 4 suffering. The Holy Spirit is unique and he can comfort us in our trouble in a way that nobody ever can. A few verses later, Jesus describes this parakletos again to his disciples and that's in verse 26 but the helper 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus said, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you, Jesus said. The word remembrance here is not mere intellectual or cognitive remembrance. It means a real, vivid, compelling, and experiential remembrance of Christ. Peter, who was present with Jesus when Jesus describes the Holy Spirit in this way, talks about this very same experience later when he wrote 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter in the New Testament. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he summarizes this entire sermon in just three sentences. Let me read that for you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the redemptive chapter 4 suffering we have been talking about. Peter then goes on to say, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, though you have not seen Christ, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Though we have not seen Christ, it is the parakletos, our comforter, the Holy Spirit, who brings Christ to our experiential remembrance and produces in our hearts an experiential remembrance of him and a deep love for him. Though we do not now see Christ, we believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible. This inexpressible joy, this experiential remembrance of Christ, whom we have never seen but wholeheartedly believe in with all of our heart, this is what the Holy Spirit or the Parakletos, our comforter, does in us. Ultimately, the Parakletos, the Holy Spirit, comforts us by bringing Christ to bear upon our hearts. You know, our faith in Jesus now is like being in a long-distance relationship. He's in heaven, we are on earth, and one day he's going to come back to take us to be his bride. So yes, this is a long distance relationship. Many, many, many people have become unfaithful or at least a little different, a little indifferent in their long distance relationships. We are like that too. All of us, without exception, we are unfaithful to some degree or the other in our long-distance relationship with Christ. But when one partner in a long-distance relationship begins to stray and turns unfaithful, he or she often has a friend. And this friend will bring gentle and loving correction to this unfaithful partner. This true friend will strengthen the unfaithful partner to be faithful to his or her betrothed. The Parakletos, the Holy Spirit, is that one true, true friend who strengthens us to be faithful to Christ, our bridegroom, Messiah. He comforts us by making Christ real, vivid, and present in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the spark that 
keeps the flame of our relationship alive till Christ, our bridegroom Messiah, comes again. Let me close by pointing us one last thing from this passage. We must never forget that it is ultimately the Trinitarian God who comforts us in our troubles. God the Father adopted us into his family. Christ, his son, our bridegroom, is preparing for us a place to come back and take us to be his bride. The Holy Spirit, the Paracletos, the Comforter, brings Christ to experiential remembrance and strengthens us to be faithful to our bridegroom Messiah. The Trinitarian God comforts us in our chapter 4 suffering. In your darkest hour, in the deepest anguish of your suffering, always remember the Trinitarian God himself will be your greatest strength and your greatest comfort. Let us pray. Our Father, we wait on you by faith for your Holy Spirit to come and strengthen every one of us to be faithful to Christ and to place in our hearts deep comfort in every chapter four suffering that you've allowed us to walk through till Christ comes again. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.